Believing and Saying the Keys to Faith. Reading from Kenneth E. Hagan's Legacy Bible, King James. And um, it's so important that we understand this very simple, you know, childlike faith. God made the gospel simple enough for a childlike person or a child. So, believing and saying the keys to faith. Notice the words of Romans 10, 8. But what does it say? The word is near you, even in your mouth and in your heart. That's the word of faith, which we preach. How does this compare with the words of Jesus? In Mark eleven twenty three, Paul's writings to the Romans agree exactly with what Jesus told his disciples when he said, Whosoever shall say and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe, shall have whatsoever he saith. He says, we see here the basic principle inherent in the God kind of faith, believing with the heart and speaking with the mouth. Jesus believed it and he said it. God believed it and he said it, speaking the earth into existence. Verse 9 and 10 at this same, of this same chapter of Romans says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy, your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now I'll just remind you again about that word confession. So it's not, so we're both on this, all on the same page here. You know, if you go to a police station and you have witnessed some, witnessed some terrible thing, your testimony is your confession at that police station. Doesn't mean you did bad, it just is the things you are testifying of what you know in your heart to be true. So a measure of faith is dealt to the sinner through hearing the word. Then he uses it to create the reality of salvation in his own life. When Christians are asked, when, when were you saved? And often answer by saying something like, at nine o'clock on the night of July 10th, and I was saved at about 11 o'clock at night, February 27th, 1986, and um, was a terrible storm outside, terrible, uh, the residual of a terrible storm, very icy outside when I, where, on, <clears throat> and at that day earlier, I slipped on the ice and broke my ankle terribly and had a miracle healing of, of my ankle, and God used that experience to reduce me to the place that I could finally admit that I needed, I needed, I needed God. I needed help. Uh, I was very independent, I thought, mm. when I think of God's mercy. Oh, wow. So, um, a measure of faith is dealt, it's given to the sinner through hearing the word. So, I had heard the word through my sister who had gotten filled with the Holy Ghost about six weeks prior. And uh, she told me just enough to whet my appetite and, and make me hungry for something she had received that I had never experienced. So when Christians are asked, when were you saved? They say so-and-so, but they are mistaken. God saved them nearly 2,000 years ago. It only became a reality to them when they believed and they testified of it. They confessed it. Salvation belongs to everyone. Every man, every woman in this world has a legal right to salvation. What does salvation mean? Oh, there's God. I mean, 
and there are, there are no atheists in a foxhole. Everybody cries out to God in desperate times because God put the truth inside of every human being. We're not just an intellect. We are a spirit. We are a spirit, and we never die, ever. We are who we are. We look like who we are, except much better. Always and forever. Why? Because God is. He really is. He's the creator of every beautiful, every beautiful bush out there. God. Mm. When I think where I would be if I had not bowed my knee back there on February 27th, 1986. Anyway, every man, every woman in the world has a legal right to salvation. Jesus died for the whole world, not just for you, not just for me. When the truth is preached, and that's what my sister did, she just told me enough to whet my appetite. When the truth is preached to the sinner, that was me, I was I mean, I don't care if you, the only thing you've ever done is, is taken a safety pin that didn't belong to you. That makes you a thief, period. Every one of us. <laughs> and if you thought evil thoughts of anger toward people who've done you terrible things, it makes you, in your heart, you're, you're a, like a murderer because of that hatred of what people have done to say maybe to somebody that you loved or even some wicked thing people did to your pet. Don't kid yourself that there's some kind of scale. You know, you didn't do as bad as the people you see on television. Don't numb yourself to the truth. We are all sinners, every single one of us. And when we receive Christ by the words of our mouth, because of responding to the truth that God put in our hearts, that old sin nature is ripped out of us. <laughs> well, taken out of us. And God, I don't know how, but God put a brand new being inside of me, a spirit being. And I loved one teaching I heard, and that is, you know, there are three kinds of people on this planet. There are, and the Bible talks about these three people groups. There are the Jews, which are the covenant people, the chosen ones, the apple of his eye, the one through whom he brought the Savior, and he's never stopped. God doesn't break his word. He made a covenant with Israel, with the land of Israel, with the people, the Jews. Who in the world would ever think that a people that was totally spread out all over the world and their nation destroyed would keep their identity for 2,000 years and come back to that land? It's all a miracle. Anyway, I heard one great, I can't remember who it was, but one very famous intellectual person, uh, a Jew, said, uh, they asked him, do you believe there's a God, and if so, why? And his answer was, the Jews. <laughs> I mean, I heard Dr. Billy Brim saying that, you know, let's say my, my ancestry is Lithuanian, partly in Polish and Czech and other things, but if Lithuania had been wiped off the map and uh, all the people of Lithuania scattered all over the world and intermarried, do you really think that 2,000 years later the, those Lithuanians could find each other and go back to that little parcel of land called Lithuania? No. Absolutely not. They wouldn't, the, they wouldn't remember who they were, but the Jews. Well, um, he who believes 
and confesses he creates the reality reality of his own life by his faith. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? I'm sorry, in whom they have not believed. And how shall they believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how shall they hear about him without a preacher or without a, a child of God sharing the truth? So then, how does faith come? So that, here's how it comes, faith comes by hearing. God made these ears so we could hear. <laughs> it's just all a miracle. I mean, we can't figure it out with our reason. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. Oh, the miracle is this Bible that it is <laughs> by the word of God. Hearing the word of God is what brings faith. And I had heard enough of the word of God by that time on February 27th that it finally bore fruit in my life. And I confessed with my mouth and believed in my heart <laughs> that Jesus was the Savior of the world, but not just that he loves everybody. No, that he loved me. And he, was, he could be and wanted to be and became my Savior. Just as faith comes from hearing the word of God, so does anything we receive from God. The God kind of faith comes by hearing God's word. In other words, God causes the God kind of faith to come into the hearts of those who hear. God does that. God causes God kind of faith. Now just think of God created this whole universe with his words. Oh, he created us in his image. So, the God kind of faith comes by hearing the words of God. In other words, God causes the God kind of faith to come into your heart because you've heard it. He causes that. No wonder Jesus said, take heed, therefore how? you hear. Whew. Wow. You can't let it go in one ear and out the other because that won't do you any good. Faith won't come. Faith won't come. Take it to heart. If you act as if the word of God were some fairy tale, which a lot of people do, Faith will not come. Wow. If you act as though the Bible is a fairy tale, faith won't come. When you hear somebody telling you the gospel and you and you just chalk it up to some one of those one of those them their religions, faith won't come. But when you accept it reverently and sincerely, when you act upon it, faith comes. Mm. Faith is real. It's like tangible. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, we having the same spirit of faith, According as it is written, I believed. Therefore, I spoke. I also believe and therefore speak. I changed that, those 
that construction around a little bit, I'll read it a little more closely to what 2 Corinthians 4.13 says. We, having the same spirit of faith, that's all of us who believe, according as it is written, I believed. And therefore, have I spoken? That's you. You've spoken. Once you believed, you've spoken. <clears throat> we also believe, and we therefore speak. Mm, that's what I'm doing. I believe, <laughs> and so I'm speaking. Paul said we have the same spirit of faith. And what belonged to the church at Corinth? belongs to the church today. <coughs> Sorry. On no occasion did Paul or any of the apostles ever write to encourage the people to believe. They never told them to have faith. Listen to that. Get ready. Our having to encourage believers to believe or have faith is a result of the word of God having lost its reality to us. We are believers. When our children are away from home, we don't have to write them and say, be sure to keep on breathing. No, they will continue to breathe as long as they are alive. Neither do we have to encourage believers to believe. They already believe because that is what they are, believers. How many of us realize that our words dominate us? I was just with some people last night for a little church meeting in my house. And um, there was a lady there my age, 82, and uh, she just started talking about, you know, she's old, she's old, she's old. That's not what the Bible, my Bible says. My Bible says, even in old age, you will be vital and green. There's some prime of life in your heyday, fresh as a daisy, full of life, full of truth, full of love, full of wisdom, life, life experience wisdom, full of, full of the, the aftermath of all the tragedies that we've seen in our families all along the way. That's all wisdom, how to use it all, how to believe for all of it to work together for the good. Old people are not supposed to start speaking death over themselves. I, I had a revelation that Satan has a different uh, database of fear tactics for every demographic. For teenagers, they have one set of fear. And for the 20-year-olds, they have another set of terrifying thoughts. And if you get in your late 20s and you're a woman, oh my, you're being left on the shelf. I mean... And then in your 30s. And then in your 40s, there's another whole set of, oh, it's, I'm getting old. And your 50s and your 60s. And all along the way, Satan, there's no lie that hasn't been told. Because Satan is the father of lies. And he will try at every juncture to puncture our balloon of hope. <laughs> but when you're in your 80s, think how much you've learned. Even if you just got saved when you were 79, 
still you have 79 years of history. You're like a walking library. I heard one person say that when somebody dies, it's like a library burned down. We have so much in us. So the devil tries to talk to us 80-year-olds like as if, well, this is the end of the line now. Get off that train. Don't you know it's too much trouble to be alive? Too much pain. We're not supposed to be kicked to the curb. Jesus never said that. The whole Bible is full of the encouragement to keep on, keep on, pressing on to the mark of the high calling of God, the mark of the prize of the high calling of God, Paul said. I mean, imagine if just one person makes heaven instead of hell because you decided to keep on chugging. I believe God's going to use the elder bunch of people in ways that we have never dreamed. And I believe that we, we elderly are standing right at the precipice of divine, supernatural health and healing to our joints, to our muscles, to our, our nervous system. The Bible says the word of God is health to your navel your nerves and your sinew and marrow to your bones. But that's what Brother Hagen is teaching here. You only have it if you believe it, let it in, and then if you say it. Instead of saying the things, you know, that are, you know, I'm having a senior moment. No, you're not. The devil's attacking you with dementia and you have to cast down that imagination. I have the mind of Christ. And that's the way it is, devil. I'm never going to miss a beat here. How many of us realize that our words dominate us? In Proverbs 6, 2, you are snared with the words of your mouth. Another translation says, you are taken captive with the words of your mouth. The devil wants to put you in a, in a prison of lies that you've spoken out of your mouth. Thank you, Lord. A young man once told me he was never defeated until he confessed that he was defeated. One Baptist minister put it this way. You said you could not, and the moment you said it, you were defeated. Hmm. You said you did not have faith, and doubt rose up like a giant and bound you. You are imprisoned with your own words. You talk failure, and failure holds you in bondage. Defeat and failure do not belong to the child of God. God never made a failure. God made us new creatures. And I'll go back. I started saying this about the three kinds of people. There are the Jews, and then... There are, there's the world, which are people who are still, you know, we're all born with a sin nature. We all want somebody else's chocolate. We all have a, a real selfish streak. Some of us have a very thick veneer. You can hardly even tell that they have this selfish, filthy sin nature. But until you're born again, that's what you have, a nature that is rotten to the core. And then, then there's that third group of people, the saved people. And we are one of a kind. The angels were never fallen and then redeemed. 
We are of all creation. We're a brand new, like a brand new species of being who was once dead and is, and once just mm, filth and all of a sudden a brand new creation. That's what Paul says, a new creation. Oh, oh, it's good. Defeat and failure do not belong to the child of God. God never made a failure. And it's never too late. Never too late. Doesn't matter what you've done, where you've been, how many times you've done it, who you did it with. It doesn't matter. You just say, yes. Yes, I believe. Yes. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me. I get it. We're not born of the will of the flesh. People just want sex and have a baby. We are not born of the will of man. I will do this. But we are born of the will of God. We are created in Christ Jesus. Failures are man-made. They are made by wrong believing and wrong thinking. 1 John 4.4 4 says, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Learn to trust the greater one in you. He is mightier than anything, anything in the world. Wow, greater is he that is in the king of the universe is in you. Learn to trust the greater one who is in you. He is mightier than anything in the world. God created the universe with words. Words filled with faith are the most powerful things in all the world. Words filled with faith are the most powerful thing in all the world. Make my day, devil. Make my day. And I love that line from Rocky. I didn't hear no bell. Remember that? In the boxing ring. I didn't hear no bell. I didn't hear no bell, devil. I didn't hear no bell. The key to the God kind of faith is believing with the heart and confessing with the mouth. Our lips can make us millionaires. Woo! Thank you, Lord. Or keep us paupers. Our lips, our lips. People don't want to hear this. They just want to be lazy and speak the way they've always spoken before they were even saved in the way their family said, we got to be set ourselves free from those ancestral curses, the curses of pride in being paupers, pride in being rag pickers. No, that's not what God created us to be. But he wants us to have wisdom to use wealth once we get wealth. And if we're going to be all puffed up with pride and ego and domineering oh, and domin wanting to dominate people, well, guess what? We got to change that kind of thinking. <clears throat> Our lips can make us victors or keep us captives. We can fill our words with faith or we can fill our words with doubt. You know, I feel a lot of people are actually um, loyal to the stupidity of our ancestors. Like, my parents did not walk in any of this. They, thank God, they imparted to me what they did. Thank God. But I always had socks to wear to school. 
Thank God my father didn't miss a week of work at the machine shop. But, you know, I can't be loyal to their way of thinking because it was, it was not a life of victory. It was a life of speaking, oh, those rich people. Oh, those rich people. Oh, those preachers. All they want is your money. Oh, you know, we're just happy being who we are. Barely getting along, but we're making it pride in being down. Mm. Oh, I think you get it. We can fill our words with love that will melt the coldest heart. And if you have a cold heart there, I just pray that my words melt your heart. Lord God, melt their heart. Anybody listening to this with a cold heart who've been so injured or so too proud, Father God, melt that cold, cold heart. We can help the brokenhearted and the downtrodden. You know, that's the truth. I have found that it's so much easier to minister to the downtrodden than it is to the people who think they already have it all together. Pride, competition, jealousy, religious spirits, self-righteousness. They're mean devils. But the brokenhearted, the downtrodden, their hearts are not cold. They, they can let it in that, that, that there's hope for them. We can make our words, oh, faith, that kind of faith that these people, that these people experience will move all of heaven. Huh. We can make our words breathe the very atmosphere of heaven. Mm. I'm going to tell you something. Um, two weeks ago, I was in a store. There's a beautiful black girl coming this way down the aisle, and I was going this way down the aisle. And before I got to her that she saw me, she looked around and I can't remember the words that you said, but you said, I felt, I felt you before I saw you. I, you know, that's what we have to believe for, practice the presence of God that, you know, I, really it had nothing to do with me. <laughs> God wants to use us as spectacular entities full of his glory. If we only let him. <laughs> and we had the best time. We had church, the two of us. So, our faith will never rise above the words of our lips. Our faith, wow, this is so good. Our faith will never rise above the level of what comes out of our lips. And if we speak down, like I said, you know, I'll, I'm just happy I have enough money to pay the light bill. Well, that's what you'll have, just enough money to pay the Because your words have power. That's the whole point. Your words have power. You know, life and death are in the power. I've heard Brother Andrew Walmack saying that. The, you know, so of, somebody came to him and said, I have no power. And he said, Life and death are in the power of the tongue. We have power right there in our tongue. Our faith will never rise above the words of our lips. Jesus told the woman, like a woman with the issue of blood, she pressed in and she said, if I but touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. She said it. Power was in her tongue. She said it. <laughs> oh. 
her faith by speaking the words, it, it just activated this power we call faith, and she was healed of bleeding and bleeding and bleeding and spending all her money and not being able to go around anybody, any people, because it was taboo, and she got healed. Wow. Thoughts may come, and they may persist, and this is important. You think thoughts don't come to me? Every day, there's a whole new batch of lies. Just this morning, it was a whole new batch of lies. But you have to fight your way. Cast down every one of those lies. If they contradict all the wonderful covenant goodies that God paid the, through his son, paid the price so I could have and you could have. So... Thoughts may come, and they will come. They may persist, and they will persist. But if we refuse to put those thoughts into words, if we refuse to put those thoughts into words, do you get that? You're going to have the thoughts, and you might think you're telling a lie if you don't speak those thoughts. They're evil because they're from the evil one. If we refuse to put those thoughts into words, they die unborn. Ooh, I love that. Hallelujah, I received that. Right? Hallelujah, I received that right this very minute. Cultivate the habit of thinking big things. Learn to use words that will react upon your own spirit. Faith's confession create reality. Realization follows the confession. Confession precedes possession. That's what that woman with the issue of blood, confession, what she said preceded her getting. Ah. Oh getting the very creator of the universe to move on her behalf and restored her whole body. Hallelujah. And that's available for every one of us, no matter what. Hallelujah.